Today we're going to talk about um, some of the basics of chemistry and some of the, the building blocks or the foundation that will help you understand some of the uh, more difficult concepts uh, within the realm of chemistry. Uh, this first picture that I have here is a, is a picture of carbon, lead, and gold. And these pictures are represent, representatives of um, pure substances. So this picture shows uh, nothing but carbon atoms, and this picture shows nothing but lead atoms, and this picture shows nothing but gold. Uh, we call these pure substances. Now back in 1906, there was a man named Ludwig Boltzmann, and Ludwig Boltzmann actually hung himself because he wasn't accepted for his beliefs. Uh, it, was, it was widely believed in the early 20th century and the late 19th century that um, substances could be broken down infinitely. They could be divided over and over and over and over again for an infinite amount of time. And Ludwig didn't believe this. He believed that there was a smallest particle that would exist um, that would be able to retain its properties. And this later became known as the atom uh, once the atomic theory was developed. Now this video um, that is coming up here is a video that is showing maybe it's coming up it's a video that is showing uh, what happens when we add um, a hydrogen torch uh, to gold. And you can see that gold uh, will hopefully eventually here uh, go from a state of solid uh, to a liquid state. And if we continue to add energy to gold, uh, it'll go from a liquid to a gas. That stage is obviously called evaporation. All right, we'll just come back to this here in a minute. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. And let's take a look at the next slide. Now, some of the most basic things to understand with chemistry uh, are matter, uh, elements, and atoms. And a lot of students have difficulty with the idea of elements uh, versus the idea of atoms. Um, <clears throat> elements are defined um, by what type they are. Uh, they're actually defined by the number of protein or protons that they have. Uh, and the number of protons is what determines the properties uh, or one of the main things that determines the properties uh, of a specific element. Uh, so for example, hydrogen has one proton. And uh, a hydrogen atom uh, can never have more than one proton, and it can never have less than one proton. Uh, a helium atom can never have more than two protons, and can never have less than two protons. Now, if we took something like gold, and we were to divide it down, and divide it down, and continue to do that over a long period of time, uh, what we would find is there is one building block uh, that retains the properties of gold, and we cannot divide that one building block anymore, and that one building block is referred to as an atom. So an atom is the smallest unit of matter uh, that can enter into chemical reactions. It's the smallest unit of matter that can retain the same properties, such as a melting point, or the boiling point, or the wavelength that it reflects. Now, within each atom, there are three subatomic particles. Uh, these subatomic particles you've heard of before. Uh, the first one being protons. And protons are uh, positively charged particles that are found in the nucleus of the atom. And let's just say these little pink circles here are the protons. And the neutrons uh, are represented by this dark gray shade. Uh, these neutrons are also located in the nucleus. Uh, the main difference is that protons are what define 
the specific element. And in this example, you can see that this element seems to have um, four protons, and it seems to have six neutrons. And this would be very common. Um, the number of neutrons does not always equal the number of protons, and we will talk about that later. And then these blue spheres that are around in these things called orbitals in the very poor Bohr diagram that we'll discuss here in a few minutes. Uh, these electrons are these tiny little particles that are found um, instantaneously moving or uh, being located from one place to another within this cloud that surrounds the nucleus. And these electrons have a uh, slight negative charge to them. And so something uh, for visualization sake and for you being a basic chemist now, um, you know, being able to visualize these things is very difficult. So um, for the early stages, if you could just visualize this as an electron that's uh, orbiting around this center part, um, just as the planets would orbit around the sun, that would be an adequate way to visualize it right now. Uh, in the future, you will see how that is, is uh, a slight misconception. Uh, so these electrons have a negative charge. And these protons have a positive charge. And so one thing that we, we should know by this point is that opposites attract. And so there's a, an attraction between these, these electron subatomic particles and the, the nucleus itself. And, uh, and that attraction is what keeps these electrons from flying out away into, into space. And uh, the velocity. Uh, or the, the, the energy, the kinetic energy that they contain, uh, is what allows them to, to be pushed away from the protons. So there's almost like this balancing act that keeps the electrons a given distance um, away from the nucleus. It prevents the electrons from crashing into the nucleus, and it prevents the electrons from flying off into space somewhere. Um, to give you an idea how small an atom is, um, a carbon atom, uh, uh, much of our body is actually made up of carbon atoms. And so this illustration you can see right here, um, this pie chart represents uh, all of the uh, atoms inside of the body. And you notice that carbon uh, makes up the second largest percentage just behind oxygen. Uh, carbon makes up 17.5% of our body. And so if, if you wanted to visualize how big an atom is, if you were to pull the hair from your head and look at the width, okay, or the diameter across of your hair, you could line up a million, approximately a million carbon atoms. Not along how long your hair is, but how wide your hair is. A million of them. That'll put that in perspective for you. So they are very, very, very tiny. Uh, and when we look at this uh, periodic table of elements, there's going to be a bunch of numbers on it. And uh, for you guys to understand these numbers, um, we're just going to run through some of these words here real quick, and then I'll show you uh, a periodic table. So the atomic number of an atom um, is just simply the number of protons. And it's what defines um, you know, the elements properties. Um, the atomic weight of an atom is the number of protons plus the number of electrons. And neutrons have no electrical charge. We say that they are neutral. And if something is electrically neutral, uh, an atom is electri electrically neutral, it means that the number of protons equals the number of electrons. And we will assume that unless there is an indication that that particular atom is what we would call an ion. And we'll discuss that in a bit. The periodic table is arranged in these horizontal rows and these vertical columns. And so horizontally, um, they are ranked in order of increasing atomic number or increasing number of protons. Vertically. They are arranged by the number of electrons they have in their outer shell. And those electrons they have in their outer shell are what we call valence electrons. So if we look at, and I think I have a better 
periodic table here. Okay, so let's take a look at this periodic table. Uh, this periodic table is only showing, it's color coded. It's color coded by um, what type of elements they are, whether they're gases or they are uh, alkali metals or they are noble gases or nonmetals. Um, but if you notice, the periodic table of elements starts here at hydrogen and it goes to number two, helium, then three, four, five, all the way down to neon at 10. And uh, here in, in life science, what we're most interested in is elements 1 through 20. Those uh, make up the vast majority of, of the elements that we would find in the body of living things. And so these numbers, this number 1 and this number 2 and this number 3, these are atomic numbers. It's the number of protons that the given element has. So for example, this Mg stands for magnesium, and magnesium has 12 protons. Magnesium can never have 11 protons. If an atom had 11 protons, it would be Na, which stands for sodium. So atoms have an atomic symbol, an atomic number, and an atomic mass. Um, sometimes you'll see it written like this. The, the large C is a symbol. It stands for carbon. Uh, the 12 is the atomic mass, or the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. And the number 6 here is representative of the atomic number, the number of protons. Now, some atoms differ in the number of neutrons. And so if we had a carbon atom that had 7 neutrons plus 6 protons, we would call it carbon-13. If we had a carbon atom that had six protons and eight neutrons, uh, that would total up to an atomic mass of 14, and we would call it carbon-14. Carbon-14 just so happens to be radioactive and very unstable. So carbon has three isotopes. We could find carbon in the most abundant form, carbon-12. Most carbon atoms have six neutrons and six protons. Uh, but some have seven neutrons and some have eight neutrons. Now this idea of uh, electrons, um, I'm going to elaborate on a little more before we go further. Um, if we look at this model of an atom again, this is a Bohr model of an atom. It's uh, named after a scientist named Niels Bohr, uh, who made this discovery that electrons are in these, these energy shells. Um, he made that discovery about a hundred years ago. And uh, the idea of this electron being attracted to this nucleus and having this kinetic energy and staying just far enough away and never crashing in and never flying away, um, this idea, there's some, some basics that we have to understand. Um, the closer one of these electrons is, to the nucleus, the more difficult it is to remove. So if this electron were to be removed from the atom uh, in, the, in the inner shell here, it would require a tremendous amount of energy. Uh, it would be easier to remove an electron that's from an outer energy level uh, because it's further away. And because it's further away, it doesn't have as strong of an attraction to the nucleus itself. Uh, therefore, it's easier to pick off one of these electrons. So if there were another energy level to the outside here, a third one, those electrons would even be easier to pick off. So I'm going to stop with just one more idea, and it's the idea that I've already touched on about valence electrons. If you notice, this outer energy level has eight electrons. And if you count them up, you'll see there's eight of them. And these outer electrons we will refer to as valence electrons. Valence electrons. And the valence electrons are going to always want to fulfill what we call the octet rule. And the octet rule says that atoms are happy, they are stable, when there is a full octet or eight valence electrons in the outermost shell. So all of these elements are seeking stability. Nature wants to stabilize things. 
Uh, it wants things to be um, naturally stable so chemical reactions will happen in nature in order for atoms to become stable again. And one of the things that atoms are seeking uh, on doing is they are seeking to get a full outer energy level. And this is kind of a weird concept, but we can flip back here uh, to the periodic table. And some of these elements naturally are found uh, stable. And they are found with a full outer energy level. And all of these are found in the last column. And these are called noble gases. So noble gases are very stable. They're already happy. Nature has already fulfilled the requirements. Uh, these atoms